Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this video is intended for my AP biologist. This is for us, chapter 14, and this is biotechnology and genomics. So we are going to apply what we have learned about DNA, its structure, and its replication. So we will focus on video one will be about biotechnology and then in video two i'll discuss genomics all right and for those of you who haven't watched my videos before down in the descriptor of this video are the notes that my students use and there's a link in those notes to this presentation that i'm giving right now um, so that you can have access to it if that would help you as well i encourage you i will help you take the notes in column one and then column two i encourage you to put in pictures and images Images that are helpful for you. I want to remind you um, for AP, this is all about Unit 6, um, and there are links um, on my website, etc., to these guides that I have put together with resources and information. Um, the part that applies to this chapter right here is explaining the use of genetic engineering techniques in analyzing or manipulating DNA. And so these are the topics that we will be discussing in this presentation. So first of all, I want you to see this nice glowing green mouse. And you think, who needs a green mouse? But this green mouse, what you were doing here is this is a genetically engineered mouse and that green glowing color is a marker. It's a marker to identify maybe other genes that were brought in alongside that might be harder to check for. But if a mouse glows, you know for sure that gene is there. And if you have genetically engineered another gene that you want expressed, you know that it is there as well. Something you use commonly in bacteria is antibiotic resistance. Um, that is easily to select, easy to select for, and you know that the accompanying gene um, went along with it. So we're going to start talking about cloning, <laughs> my weird cloning picture. And in your notes, this is the first part, cloning is the production of genetically identical copies of DNA, cells, or organisms through some asexual means. Now, cloning happens all the time. So let's look at some cloning. So when you grow up bacterial colonies, when you see a single, oh, I need to have a pointer here. When you see a single bacterial colony like here or here, that came from just one bacterium reproducing again and again and again. And we see his the family of that bacteria displayed as a dot growing on there. So that is reproduction asexually. If you have a strawberry plant, it has runners that grow horizontally. If you cover it with soil right there, you will get um, a clone of that strawberry plant, right? Eyes of a potato, if you take a potato and cut it up and keep the eyes in there, you can grow cloned potatoes. Identical twins, right? Those are in essence clones. So cloning is not, I don't want you to just think about Star Wars, right? This happens all the time, identical copies of a single gene. But what can be very interesting about that is if you insert a gene in your clone, let's say a bacterium, then you can get a lot of product from that clone gene. And so gene cloning, um, next number two on your notes there, identical copies of the same gene could be used for comparison or to create a product, maybe something medicinal, right? For personalized medicine. And that's where we'll end up eventually here on this topic. So gene therapy, you've heard about that already, is, is there's research done on that. There's in vivo and ex vivo. This would be an example of ex vivo because they're removing the cells. So cells are harvested from a patient, they can be altered and then their own cells, so they're not rejected or re-put into the patient. We'll be talking about that. So clone genes um, used to modify humans. Transgenic or um, organisms, These are, um, this is a transgenic cat. He costs just a mere $35,000, almost $36,000. He's genetically in engineered, so he doesn't cause allergies. So I gave you the notes for that. Um, and what we're gonna start talking about is how do you go about doing this, right? And why do you go about doing this? So 
ultimately what we're we're trying to get at is i mean you know about paternity tests right you can do that now um you can look to see your genetic ancestry right now right spit into a cup and then you can see what relatives you have um genetic fingerprinting um you can look at phylogeny the evolutionary history of organisms look to see if there's disease risk um, personalized medicine um these are all the things related right to just some of many things related to this type of biotechnology. So there are two procedures you wanna be very familiar with. Um, one is recombinant DNA technology and the other is the polymerase chain reaction. And there's some other technologies associated with those. So we're gonna start with recombinant DNA technology. So one, um, one of the first commercial products out there with recombinant DNA technology was the Glowfish. And in my class, we'll watch a video, but you can Google Google this. And so these fish are all different colors and they glow kind of like what you saw in that mouse. Um, so you want to have on your defined DNA from two or more different sources. DNA from two or more different sources. And this requires a vector. A common vector is a plasmid, that extra chromosomal little ring we've talked about before. These are easy to modify, literally with um, chemical scissors and tape. And then you can force, as we've talked about this before, this plasmid through a couple of different methods into a bacterium. Once this bacterium has this modified plasmid in it, you can get, remember DNA is just coding, you can have it transcribed and translated and get the product that you need. For instance, um, Hallmark, it, um, example of this would be the production of insulin, human insulin. Before they would harvest it from other organisms, let's say a horse, they would harvest that insulin and it's very similar to human insulin, but not exactly the same. People might have an allergic re reaction to it, but now they have taken the gene that codes for human insulin and the specific series of amino acids, sequence of amino acids in that, and they have put that gene into plasmids, right? And put those into bacterium and they get them to produce the product for us. Now, things we need to be concerned about here is there are multiple things, but one of those is the proteins, remember, need to be folded into their correct shape. And some, you can't just make everything in a bacterium, they may need to be made in a mammal. So that's a longer um, discussion, but for right now, um, um, re requires a vector to introduce recombinant DNA, and I gave you the notes already for that. So let's start talking about those chemical scissors and the chemical tape. So um, I need to get in a place where I'm not in the way. Um, here, I'll be smaller. <laughs> okay, now I'm tiny. All right, so there are chemical scissors called restriction enzymes, or another name for them is restriction endonucleases. These are your chemical scissors. And then you have chemical tape, and that is called ligase. Now, you know about ligase when you, because we've already discussed um, replication of DNA, right? And so um, remember ligase after you removed, remember the RNA primase, and you remember that you would have to put a primer down there for the DNA polymerase three to work off of, and then DNA polymerase one has to remove that and replace it, and then ligase seals the phosphate sugar backbone. The ligase commonly used in genetic engineering. This comes from a bacteriophage. Remember, viruses are great genetic engineers, and so they will cut and splice DNA. So one way that um, bacteria have protected themselves against viruses is using restriction enzymes. They have DNA, bacteria have DNA that code for enzymes that basically cut up foreign DNA. And so scientists are using those found in nature and using them to modify DNA um, for products that we want um, to harvest. So again, we can talk about the bioethical issues concerning that, but right now I'm just talking about the protocol and the procedures in that. Okay, so restriction enzymes on your notes, um, cut DNA at a specific series of bases, cut DNA at a specific series of bases called a, oh, look, I'm a mouse, called a uh, recognition sequence. Now, recognition sequence, remember our bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. So that enzyme is gonna bind at that series of bases and then basically 
cut uh, the phosphodiester bond, the backbone, in order to open up that DNA. And so um, we'll watch a video on this a little bit in class. Um, and that's the first part, the first step to form recombinant DNA. So I wanna remind you what that phosphodiester bond is. Um, in my class, we haven't talked too much about it, um, other than we know that we cut, we, uh, we use ligase, but here we're talking about cutting it, and that if you look at your sugar, remember how we number the carbons, one, two, three, four, five, the chimney's five, right? Here you have the phosphate between a three prime end of one sugar and the five prime end of another sugar. This is a phosphodiester bond. What ligase is able to do is to seal that and restriction enzymes are able to cut that. So these biological scissors, um, here you can see a recognition sequence where it would cut and you can have a blunt cut, which would be straight across and you just you know divide up the DNA. But those, those kind of cuts are not as useful because if you can have a little overhang like what you see here, then what you can do is cut two different organisms' DNA. And if you cut with a very specific enzyme, it's going to expose the same series of bases so you can mix and match your DNA and seal it with ligase. So on your notes, cuts DNA with a, at a specific sequence of bases called a recognition sequence can create a blunt cut or one with overhangs called sticky ends. And if you cut different organisms' DNA and um, if you cut different organisms DNA, but you have the same sticky ends, then they will match up so you can seal them with ligase. Um, restriction enzymes are named from where they're sourced, what organism that you got them from. So ECO um, R1 is a commonly used restriction enzyme. And if we ever get back in the classroom, my wonderful students, we will be using this restriction enzyme. Um, and so they identified the source, and this comes from um, a strain of E. coli. All right, so here, let's, uh, by coloring, I'm just showing you two different organisms' DNA. They're cut with the same restriction enzyme, and then you can seal them together. Um, and I have that in the notes already, and DNA ligase will seal the phosphate sugar backbone of the two sticky ends. All right, now, how would you use that? Well, you've cut out some DNA, let's say, for insulin for humans, right? And you would cut open a plasmid with the same restriction enzymes, ligase, you seal it, you then have kind of force it into um, bacterium, multiple, right? And then you grow them up in a bioreactor. They're making now clones. All of them contain the same plasmid. And if given um, whatever mechanism you have to turn on that gene, let's say feeding it a type, feeding that E. coli a type of sugar, Remember how we talked about RNA polymerase binds to the promoter and remember how we need to turn that on? So maybe you need to feed it a different, a specific food source in order to turn that gene on and make that product whatever it is you might want. Now, a couple of things we need to talk about. We know there's differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic DNA. So if you would like a bacterium to express one of our eukaryotic genes, the first thing you need to know is you have to have some regulatory regions on there so you have a switch to turn that gene on, right? You need to, to transcribe and translate that gene that RNA polymerase needs to bind to a promoter, and you need to have a way to activate that. Um, the second is it can't have any introns in it. Remember, prokaryotic genes are transcribed, and literally after they're transcribed, they are immediately translated. We don't do that. Remember all of our mRNA modifications in order to make our mature RNA, how we have to cut out the introns. So you cannot have any introns in the gene that you put into um, the bacterium. So one um, strategy then is you have heard of retroviruses um, um, and these are viruses that are have the nucleic acid um, made out of RNA. And what they do is they also have the enzyme reverse transcriptase that they can use to make a DNA copy. This is what the virus does to make a DNA copy 
um, and then, then another enzyme called replicase to make it double stranded. And then they insert their RNA code now as a DNA code into our host cells. So we can use that um, in order to make a DNA copy. Um, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. We can use that because what we'll use is we'll use the mRNA um, that is in its final mature form, right, with all the introns cut out, and we can use reverse transcriptase to get a clean copy of DNA without any introns in it and use that to put into the bacterium. And then you need a vector to get it in those cells. So on your note, side note, in order for human genes to be expressed in a bacterium, you must have bacterial regulatory regions, must not have introns, and you can use reverse transcriptase. And I gave you all of that in the notes. And number three, you need a vector. All right, so we talked about um, the use of recombinant DNA technology. Now let's talk about another, um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot I gave you a couple of examples in here. Okay, so you cut, um, as far as the sequence, right, overall, you cut the foreign DNA in the plasmid with the same restriction enzymes. Now this would have to be a clean copy if it was eukaryotic, right? Cut them with the same restriction enzymes, mix them together, Okay, and then use ligase to seal up your, your plasmids. Then what you would do is you would force bacterium to take those plasmids in. Now you have no guarantee that they took the correct, um, that they took the plasmid in, right? They may not have picked it up. Also, when you're making these plasmids, you, you have no guarantee that you're making it exactly as you want it. So you need to have a selection process, one selection process that we would use in class if we can get back into class, um, is you can use an antibiotic and you can use that antibiotic to go travel along with the other genes. So if the bacterium um, has picked up that plasmid, it ha the correct plasmid, it's also picked up an antibiotic resistance and you can grow your bacteria on plates and only those that have the antibiotic resistance because you have it mixed in with a medium are able to survive and reproduce. Okay, and so that would be one way to select for the bacteria that were sec successfully artificially transformed. All right, so um, that we have a whole lab on, which I hope we get to do, um, our Amgen lab. All right, now, um, to get on to the second one, the polymerase chain reaction, let's say you're at a crime scene and you only have a small sample of DNA, maybe a blood sp splatter or something like that, and you're like, I wanna analyze this DNA, but I have so little of it, okay? So what you can do is what's called um, the polymerase chain reaction, and this is done by a machine called a thermocycler. And basically what this does is it forces, puts the right conditions to make your small sample of DNA replicate itself multiple times. Now remember DNA replication is semi-conservative replication. And so you have your original stand. Remember they have to unwind and unzip. So you know about topoisomerase and helicase and the roles that that plays. Well, a way to do that artificially is just to apply a lot of heat and the DNA will denature into single strands that you can use. But then the problem comes up with what enzymes can withstand that heat that they can still be used. And so you do have to use, I mean, jump ahead a slide. Um, one, ins, one that is used is, remember archaea, right? Those are extremophiles. Um, this is still a prokaryotic cell, but it can withstand high temperatures. So you use the TAC enzyme. It's a type from Thermus aquaticus. That's why they call it the TAC enzyme, genus species name. So this is a type of DNA polymerase um, that can withstand high temperatures. And what you basically are doing is you're heating it, heating up a sample. Okay, so it goes into single strands. You're adding in your nucleotides that you need, right, with containing adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, and primers, and you allow that DNA to replicate itself using that TAC enzyme, a type of DNA polymerase that can withstand heating. You allow it to cool, and then you re, now let's say you have two copies, right? Actually way more than that, but you understand. Then you heat those up and then process on repeat, allow it to replicate itself um, after you've cooled it down and again and again and again. And 
over the course of you know a few hours, you can end up getting millions of copies of that same DNA. So that thermocycler, um, which they're calling a PCR machine here, that thermocycler is a DNA photocopier. All right, so on your notes, you have like a DNA photocopy machine, steps, little letter A, heat to denature the DNA, add primers and bases, add in a DNA polymerase, and I specifically mentioned TAC, which was extracted from Thermos aquaticus. Now, what do you do with that DNA? Well, if you're going to analyze that DNA, um, one way is through a process called gel electrophoresis. So this is like expensive gelatin, and it has what you see on this end right here are little divots. So as the gelatin's hardening, you're putting a comb in there to create divots. And what you do is you use a micropipetter to load small samples of DNA within your gel, and you turn on an electric current, and the DNA will start moving through the sugars of the gel. Now here's the deal. The smaller the fragments, the easier it is to move through those carbohydrates. The bigger the fragments... Um, the slower. So what you can do is you can compare um, known and unknown. You would have a control banding that you have in here. And this, this is a double gel. So here are wells here that they ran DNA. And then there are wells here and they ran some DNA. And what you do is you can compare fragments of the DNA of known samples to your unknown in order to determine the size. There's a lot more on that with gel electrophoresis, but let me start with this. Gel electrophoresis, you add DNA to the gel. This is in your note. You pass a current through the gel, okay? And what happens is you put a positive charge on one end, and you know that phosphate sugar backbone and the phosphates and all those oxygen, it's negatively charged when you have fragments of DNA, it's negatively charged. So it's attracted, moves in this case from left to right, attracted to the positive end. Okay, so that's why you pass a current through the gel. DNA will sort itself due to size. Smallest is fastest. So here is now a cartoon version of this, a little drawing. So you're putting in your DNA into the well holes, okay? And you have um, your positive charges here, and the DNA is negatively charged, so it's drawn towards it, and they're separated by size. Okay, and then what you want to do is you add dye to it that will bind to the DNA and then you can visualize that dye with the UV light. So you don't see the DNA, you see the dye that has attached itself to um, the DNA and there are green versions of that that we do in our classroom. Um, and then you can compare these banding patterns. So you could know how many base pairs like Column one here could be known base pair, known base pair size. And so what you could do is then predict your unknown based upon your known. All right. And then what would you want to do with that? Well, one of those things could be DNA profiling or DNA fingerprinting, right? You can't, you know, you can get rid of your fingerprints, but you can't get rid of your DNA fingerprints that identify you. So DNA fingerprinting and profiling using unique patterns created by sorting cut up DNA by size. So, and then you, I gave you the notes on that. You can use gel electrophoresis. Um, you can look for specifically what's called short tandem repeats um, that are unique to you. And I put on there that the FBI uses about 13 of these different locators that they use to compare. So, simply because you can't see DNA in a test tube and it's kind of shown to you here. So you have these three different test tubes and let's say you have some unknown um, samples in there and known. What you'll do is you'll digest them all with restriction enzymes and if it's the same DNA from the same person, it's going to cut that DNA in the same places because they have the same series of bases, right? The same recognition sequence. So you can just look on this picture and see two and three are getting cut with the same size fragments produced, which is different than individual one. Then when you load that up into your gel and then turn on that electric current, then it's going to sort itself out. So in this case, you're looking at repeats. And so you're going to compare the banding patterns and go, OK, crime scene evidence um, and suspect B um, match. So it was probably suspect B, not suspect A.
All right. Now there is one problem with this image that is put out there and I, I'm going to let you think about it here for a minute and see if you can get it. But the DNA patterns, what they'll do is they will sort themselves according to size, right? So I don't want to do this to confuse you, but I want to make sure you see this and we can clarify it. So what would be bigger? One with 12 repeats or one with 16 repeats, right? 16 would be bigger, right? So you would expect a larger piece of DNA and maybe a smaller piece of DNA, right? You can see them here. So you would expect the 16 to be back here and the 12 to be here. And um, the reason why I say that is when they made this diagram, they should have made this guy with the 12 repeat, his would travel farther, so his band should have been out here. So I just want you to see that in case that, that stood out to you. So other um, PCR applications detect viruses and cancer. Um, there could be um, crime scene that you can get from the site, do PCR and then do your gel electrophoresis. Um, idea of victims, family members, disorders, organisms, illegal catches, um, phylogeny, evolutionary relationships, that's number four. Okay, so this is typically what a gel would look like. All right, um, one thing you can analyze for um, evolutionary relationships is looking at humans, because as you know, right, our nuclear DNA is a combination from both of our parents. Your mitochondrial DNA only comes from your, from the female, from the egg, right? Because all that the sperm is contributing, right, is his nuclear DNA to your offspring. So when you study mitochondrial DNA, you're studying the line of the mother and your mother's mother and so forth. And that could really give you a phylogeny of your family, as opposed to studying nuclear DNA, which is a constant combination of two different sources of DNA, where mitochondrial DNA comes from one source. All right, so that that gave you some of the techniques. And I wanna finish up um, this discussion just by giving you a little survey of some biotechnology products. Um, GMOs, I'm sure you've heard of those in the news, but those are genetically modified organisms. They are referred to as being transgenic because they are genetically modified. And what uh, biotechnology products are what, G what GM GMOs can produce for us. So the first one on there is you have genetically modified bacteria there in your notes. So just go over a couple things on genetically modified bacteria. Remember, large bioreactors um, can produce uh, medicinal products that we need in large volume. They have used bacteria to mine things out of rocks that are hard to get. They have genetically engineered bacteria to degrade oil. So if there was an oil spill, you could spray that area um, and so it would break down the oil on the water and then commit cellular suicide when they're done. Um, they could coat plants with bacteria that would protect them from frost. I'm going to tell you, I just Googled frost on plants to get this picture. So there's no bacteria on this one. And I've given you several on there in your notes already. So the only thing you need to, to fill in your notes for my students is under number two, promote health of plants, protect from frost, insect toxins, etc. Um, and then underneath degrading substances, you can see where I have, this is a form of bioremediation um, using microorganisms or plants to detoxify pollutants in the environment. All right. And then um, you could genetically engineer plant um, tissues to produce hormones or clotting factors or antibodies. Maybe instead of getting a shot, you have to eat a piece of corn. Um, usually this has to be done at what's called the protoplast. And so on your notes, usually using protoplast embryos with cell walls removed for easier insertion of genes using an electron electric current. And I've given you some, some different examples in there. Uh, pest resistance, higher nutrient content, um, production of human proteins like hormones and clotting factors and antibodies, treatment of uh, tumors or herpes. And so, like I said, you would need to, you've got this uh, insecticide gene created using recombinant DNA technology. You cut it with a restriction enzyme. You have a vector, a plasmid that you cut with the same restriction enzyme. And then you've got to get this DNA 
into these protoplasts so they can take up at these embryonic plant um, stage and then grow those plants up. And then basically they would be generating their own insecticide proteins instead of you spraying them. Are there bioethical issues surrounding that? Yes, of course there are. Um, we will have some time to talk about that and the bioethics of it. Uh, I'm just gonna show you a fun one because I like it and that is the pomato. Um, it's a potato on the bottom. It's like the mullet of plants. It's a potato on the bottom and a tomato on the top. I think that's pretty cool. Um, there are studies done about genetically modified foods, about allergens. That's a big concern about, is there something like if you're putting fish genes into tomatoes to make their skin tougher so that you can pick them when they're more ripe and they, and they don't bruise, what if I'm allergic to that fish allergen? Um, also once it's out in the, in the world, right, some plant, you, you don't know what bee is going to pollinate what and there could be environmental concerns about that as well. So there, there's lots of discussions about that in. There are about eight commercially available GMO crops um, that are currently, maybe even more now, that are currently sold. All right, um, let me move myself here. Okay, and I thought this one was kind of cute. Um, this transgenic plant emits green fluorescence when it needs water, and that would probably help me keep some of my um, plants alive. So it would glow when you need it to water it. All right, and then transgenic animals, that's huge and it is harder. We're more complex. Um, there's bioethical issues surrounding that where sometimes people don't feel bad for plant embryos if they die, but animal embryos, if uh, they die, that becomes an issue, right, to talk about. Um, you, the way you go about doing this is very s simplified. You could take a human gene and you need to get that into an egg, like an egg donor here. And that in, in requires some pretty um, sophisticated pro-nuclear injection, um, putting that DNA in there. And then you have a host, in this case, a host goat that you implant this egg in. And then, um, then when the transgenic goat is born, remember it looks like this because that was the egg donor, you could harvest the product in the milk or the urine. Um, and then you would probably want to make more, if you got this transgenic goat and this embryo is good, then you would want to make more of those. So what you would need to do is you would need to take uh, eggs, remove the nuclei from them, enucleate those eggs, and then through microinjection, you would take uh, the eggs from your transgenic goat and put those in there so that you could make more clones of that. And there's lots of fails in that. When you talk about, you know, from what we've talked about with control of gene expression, how many things need to be in play in order to turn on genes and related to development and euchromatin and heterochromatin DNA, right? So that's a very, very complicated process. So on genetically uh, modified animals, the only thing I'll help you just with the filling in of the notes, on number one, micro-inject DNA into eggs. Um, on number three, where I have gene farming, and yes, that's spelt with a PH, like pharmaceuticals, using transgenic farm animals to produce pharmaceuticals in milk. Um, cloning transgenic animals, I gave you everything there except uh, 4C, micro-inject a 2N or diploid nucleus from the transgenic organism. Um, F, I said, why not just use bacteria? Because the post-translational folding, remember the post-translational controls, right? After you've made the protein, it has to be folded correctly, is done in mammalian cells and greater volume of the product. And then some examples of what they've done with this is the Siri gene. If you remember the Siri gene, that was the gene that um, in the Y chromosome that gave you your male sex. So when mouse Siri gene was injected into the genome of an XX zygote, which should be a female, um, you got a transgenic female developing from that, but it was sterile, but it was sterile because it didn't have all the other factors that you needed. Um, so you have that injection of Siri DNA made from female mice. Um, then a knockout mouse, this is kind of interesting. In the knockout mouse, what they do is they genetically engineer um, cells that have been disrupted so that certain genes that should be on for that functional mouse to work, they um, 
they've disabled those genes. And then what they can do is if they eliminate the good genes, then they can do treatments and see if that um, helps them. And so this has been already done. So under on your notes, 5B, knockout mouse, good copies of the gene are eliminated and then used in test treatments. And they've done that um, with cystic fibrosis. All right, so that's a knockout mouse. And then gene therapy, there's ex vivo where you remove the cells and in vivo where you don't remove any cells, you have to put in a vector that the uh, body will uptake. And so on that, um, on, go here, okay, for ex vivo on your notes, inserting genes into cells that have been removed from the body and then you return those. And examples, um, of, I gave you one in the book about um, an immunodeficiency disease um, and treating their bone marrow. And then in vivo, in vivo therapy, the gene is directly delivered into the body and there are trials currently in treating cystic fibrosis using nose spray, um, fat droplets, um, and the more um, some antiviral um, drug, uh, some different diseases that affect the lungs. And then along those notes, I cannot, uh, we need to talk about COVID, right? In, a, in, in this idea of gene therapy, because mRNA um, from the spikes on the, on the virus um, that, that our immune system recognizes, we're sending in copies in the COVID vaccine, we're sending in copies of mRNA so that our cells will take that mRNA in the cytoplasm and generate the viral spikes so that our immune system can learn uh, what to be afraid of quicker instead of us actually coming down with that disease. So that would not be considered gene therapy, but I think it is appropriate at this time to discuss. And that, my friends, um, that finishes up part one and um, video two, I will then discuss uh, genomics. And if you are one of my students, I will see you in class.